her artistic artistic practice. So before I continue, the first disclaimer is that I'm in a place where my internet is not so stable. So I'm sorry about that. I might just cut off at some point or my audio might cut off at some point. Um, a welcome everyone. So um, I think most of you already know uh, much about Sisters in Spirit. Hi, Shabnam. Hi, Maria. Hi, Sandra, Gita. Um, so I don't have to say much, but in case I think I'm not sure if Gita is familiar with Sisters in Spirit, I just like to quickly say it's an independent project that I set up in November 2020. Uh, with the aspiration to bring uh, the teachings of non-duality and compassion as espoused in Buddhism in conjunction with science, with creative arts, with, ex with activism. And uh, Nivita Arora, who's here, is the, the backbone, the behind the scenes of Sisters and Spirit. Uh, without her support, none of this can happen. Um, I, I'm not going to make a very formal introduction to Senna, but what I want to say is that Senna did an undergraduate uh, degree in economics and then uh, did a um, master's of fine art from Bard College in upstate New York, uh, specializing in film and video. Senna is currently uh, based in Istanbul in Turkey, though right now, right now, she is not in Istanbul. She'll tell us where she is. I met Sena in 2007, eight, I don't know, nine, 2008, nine maybe, 2008. eight at Bard College in upstate New York, where I attempted to get an MFA, but I gave up. Uh, so somehow uh, we have continued to have uh, friendship and kinship across time and space. I'm very grateful for that. And uh, for sharing your work with us. Welcome everyone, welcome Senna and over to you. Thank you. Thank you Tejal for this introduction. Hello everybody. Um, it's a very special thing for me to uh, do this presentation today for Sisters and Spirits. I'm uh, very happy to be part of this group and I'm very grateful um, for our connection with Tejal that lead me here and um, enabled me to meet all of you. And um, I've benefited immensely from our sharings. And um, so I was very humbled when Tejal asked me to uh, present for the group. Um, and um, to be honest, I will improvise, like I put images of my work. I went very back and I wanted it to be more personal than a professional presentation of my work. So I went really back to 2006 even. And um, yeah, I will just like talk over them from a personal perspective and please uh, feel free to interrupt me add uh, anything you would like to add or ask anything you would like to ask. And uh, well, I think I'll just start right away from where Tejal left. Um, share screen. I prepared a slideshow and brought some videos with me. Yes. Yes, the title of my talk is The Art of Healing. Um, healing is um, the general theme um, that I'm working on, that my artistic research is on. But I want to go back to where how it all started. And uh, Tejal knows actually the very beginnings of the story. Um, as Tejal said, I studied economics, which is something I have very little interest in, to be honest, like. <laughs> Maybe something that I'm like least interested in, in an array of topics, but uh, Alice, I found myself studying economics. Uh, you know, studying art was always something I wanted. I intuitively felt the need to do it. 
but then I didn't have the courage to do it. And also, you know, I'm from Turkey and uh, it's a very unstable place uh, already. So like jobs that bring some stability in your life are more appreciated. And um, so I had good grades. And uh, during the 90s, all my cousins became bankers and all that. And, you know, I didn't have an artist role model. And I was shy, I guess, to know, to share, you know, it's very, in a way, um, it's where some courage to put yourself out there, like show your art and all that. And I guess I was not ready. And all, because of all these reasons, I found myself studying economics in Bozic University. But once I stopped, stepped into the campus, this university is actually a very good university in Istanbul. That's how I migrated to Istanbul too. And it's very resourceful. That was my luck, actually. There were uh, art, art studios for ceramics, sculpture, painting, and I could take art history classes as electives. So I started to live a life like that in the campus. While I was studying economics, I was you know, creating this side life of studying art for myself. Um, but then like, I didn't know how to continue upon graduation. I had to somehow steer the wheel of my life from economics to art. But then I always say I was trying to make a U-turn and I crashed the car. Like I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I ended up working in a business plaza to earn money because my parents were like, well, you know, if you're not working in Istanbul and if you're not figuring out your life, you might as well come back to Denizli, my hometown, you know, establish a family, a traditional life and all that. Now that's how I ended up having a job in finance. And then I was there for three and a half years, actually. I started there temporarily, but then I leaned into it. And at some point I was like, how will I ever get out of this? You know, I guess I'll retire from, <laughs> from this life of finance. But at the same time, I was having an immense difficulty in adapting to this surrounding of mine. I, for me, it was very exotic, the business plaza. And I felt the need to record it because I found it very interesting. Yani, I felt like I did not belong. I felt like I was alienated all the time. And um, then I wanted to document it. I wanted to make work about it. Uh, until that time, I was painting and making sculptures every now and then. I never took a camera in my hand. But because of the immense alienation that I felt, like fish out of water kind of feeling in the business plaza, I decided to get a camera to record what's going on there, you know. And I started creating this creative visual diary of my life in the business plaza. Here you see a work I did in 2006. To be honest, these works I did not do uh, to exhibit anywhere or to show in an exhibition. I had no final goal and I didn't exactly know what I was doing. Um, my, um, while we're talking on healing, I find these videos very important because I think these were my way to stay above water. Like this expressive power of art was like healing and, um, you know, keeping the record of the time I spent in this plaza was actually recorded this way. And it was, it had a healing effect on me. I, I was really holding on to this, like this power of art making, let's say. So nobody is indispensable is the first video I made. This was what my boss said um, the day I was employed to this job. She said, Sena, nobody is indispensable. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, it's kind of an impossible place to put your roots in. But then I was so obsessed about it. Like I was forcing myself into it and I was bumping my head, head against it. Um, maybe you don't have to have your roots in a business plaza, you know, thinking about it now. Uh, but then I was very, you know, upset about it. 
And this is another a scene from another video I made, made called Tower Nest. I made these videos in a very simple manner. I used Windows Movie Maker, like I had a PAL simple camera. And for example, this is called The Flow. I was like, we, at that time, this is after the, like, um, the thing is there was a lot of paranoia about entering a business plaza in Turkey, entering shopping malls too. I don't know the situation in India, but you need to go through x-rays at all times. So every morning we were getting through x-rays and I had this weird relationship with these guys at the security corner. Like they see inside my bag every day, but we barely had a relationship. So I started putting things in my bag that might be interesting for them to see. And I casted this fish from lead and put them in my bag. And then I put them through the x-ray. And then I asked the um, war cameraman at Reuters to document it for me because my simple camera wouldn't uh, shoot a screen because of the shutter screen difference. So, you know, these are made like in a very simple manner. Um, after a while, you know, I first started a master's in Turkey, actually. Like I realized I can't do this anymore like this. So I started a double life for a year. I was going to a master's program in arts in Istanbul and uh, working at Reuters as a data executive for you know, financial data. And this is a work I did at that time. It's called Swimming Across. And here I'm dressed like a competitive swimmer. And I swam in the office in this outfit. And I didn't envision it to be like this, but it was a very painful process. I got wounded really badly due to this carpet of the office space. I also shot another version of this in a, in a domestic space too. Um, I call this period of my art making friction and wounding because I think I was like, like really rubbing myself against these environments that I don't belong in and I was getting like wounded due to the friction and I was documenting it let's say so this is the last work I did at my office like before they fired me I actually had the courage to resign in the end and I had applied to Bard College where I met Tejal and I went there to Bard College Oh, uh, once I was out of the office, my interest in the office building actually um, went away. Then um, I remembered what I initially wanted to become, actually. When I was a little girl, I wanted to become a nurse. It's, uh, my father uh, was a surgeon, a general surgeon, and I would go to the hospital to patient visits with him sometimes to the hospital. And the nurses were so nice to me, you know, they would put their cap on my head and they would take me to their room. I looked up to the people a lot, but then I, I think as a metaphor too, like this giving, caregiving, but not taking the credit kind of role, uh, the nurses have spoke to me as a woman because um, there is all these expectations um, from women as a gender role to be the, caregiver the giver at the same time i was feeling after all that friction and wounding i couldn't take care of myself as a nurse like i'm supposed to give but i uh, couldn't i wasn't well <laughs> myself and uh, in my relationships too this reflected like where i found myself like um depleting my resources um but it never being enough and you know and um, so I grew this alter ego and I started going to Bard College on my, I think, second year. Maybe Tejal didn't witness this. In this nurse disguise from the 80s, I was wearing this um, head, do you call it a cape, maybe? And, uh, you know, I was dressed as a nurse. And one day, um, going to the school on a bicycle, I fell down, actually and my knees were bleeding in my nurse costume and I was having a laughing fit because like I was the wounded nurse. I was like in blood and I had dirt on my hands and yet I was in full nurse gear. You know, I was doing different things. I was going to the Times Square and taking strangers' uh, pulses. Um, as a nurse, I was, you know, 
trying different performances. I made this video in 2009, yet I showed it nowhere. Uh, it's just a suffering nurse video. Nothing else happens. It's just like, I'm in the domestic space. I'm in weird bodily positions. I'm like stretching, but never relaxing. And then I'm in the sick bed and I'm the nurse. However, during this time also, I made a video. This is my thesis work uh, called Doctoring. This is a set of photographs that I go through throughout the video. And each image I do, um, um, what is this called? I dress the wound of each image. And uh, sometimes it looks like it kind of makes sense. Sometimes it looks like it doesn't make, make sense. Sometimes I hesitate, sometimes it looks it's like actually I'm giving some damage, you know, I'm responding to images, but these images are like, some of them are really personal, like the hand of my partner or the house, this is the house of my grandfather. Um, but some of them are just like, you know, shot in traffic, like these places where your body touches the world, all these friction points and they're on image and um, it's a long video. So far, all the videos I showed, I didn't, um, I won't show here because they're all online without a password. And if you're interested, you can access them uh, from my website. Or if you Google them, all the office videos and this also are online. So actually what happened next was I went back to Turkey and tried to re-establish my life as an artist. I started teaching, I started try to find a way to earn my living, um, not through art, but you know, through other means related to art, let's say. And in 2016, the date is wrong in this one, I was invited to, um, I was like, I had a commission by Zeynep as the creator. Um, there was a production fund called Spot and she invited me to make work using this commission. Then I shot a new, I wanted to revisit this idea of the nurse again. Like I, I was wondering how will I, like I was not as miserable, you know. I uh, had um, steered the wheel of my life in a direction I desired. And, you know, I processed some of the issues I was dealing with at that time. And then I wanted to revisit this um, nurse figure because once I stayed over water, like the concept of healing, these tools and agents of healing became interesting for me. Like I started to focus on healing as a concept itself. Like I could look at the situation from the outside once I was good enough, let's say. First, it was like an emergency um, thing for me to hold on to art. Later on, I was like, okay, then, you know, how do I heal? Why do I want to do it? why do I want to uh, heal? What are the tools of healing? What are the conditions of healing? Who is this nurse, etc. So I will show an excerpt from this video, but I'll stop share and share as a video. Just a second. Share screen. Share computer sound. Okay, it was correct. Share. Yeah, share the computer sound. Okay. So I'll just show an excerpt from Be the Doctor Practice Nursing, my second nurse video that people saw actually. In this nurse video, I have to say a few things. I am a contemporary nurse. I'm not a nurse clinging to the past. I'm not an 80s nurse anymore. I'm a contemporary nurse. I don't wear this head uh, cape anymore. And I just brought a two minute and a half excerpt, but it's a seven minute long uh, video. I brought the resolution part. I have to say in the first parts, what happens? Uh, there are three parts. In the first part, I'm in my hometown in my nurse costume. And I have a screen, medical screen. And it's actually an original screen of my father that he used for his operations back in the day. And I'm carrying the screen everywhere I go. I'm opening the screen. I'm hiding behind the screen. I'm closing the screen. I carry it somewhere else. I open it. I hide behind it. I carry it somewhere else. It's both heavy, but also there is always this feeling of separation and hiding, but there is no comfortable point that I reach. It's always like here and there, but I'm always trying to put up my screen, hide myself, show myself, 
not feel comfortable, get my screen, go to some other location, etc. And this is the starting from the second part. In the second part, actually, again, I'm in the domestic space in some uncomfortable position, which tells the audience that the nurse might be a bit depressed. And let's watch the rest of it. Let me go back to the presentation. Where is it? Yes. Um, so this is the end scene of the video. Yeah, this was a shooting process in which the scenario was not set. We were shooting scenes that I liked and then I was working with the scenes and then we had decided like I was like I will shoot some more scenes like I had that flexibility with which really turned it into a research process for me two things um, stayed with me like this video is very informing for my later practice one is the regeneration of the frozen birds like um, um, I'm really um, fascinated with the regeneration or coming to life of what is dead frozen stale and uh, it is something I investigate in my practice here this could be like a something delayed like a desire that's not uh, that's suppressed something like this but I also see those birds as the archive an archive frozen and in the freezer and then I bring them back to life and I will talk about this more a bit later but the most important thing that I learned from making this video was like, I didn't know what to do with the screen towards the end of this video. It was a heavy weight that I was carrying. So I left it in a forest in the end of the video. And then um, this actually, like I, 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 I remember that I can just trust the nature itself, the processes of nature, like a wound actually requires dressing. Now you can take care of a wound, but what it needs eventually is time and the nature 
takes care of itself, like organism repairs itself. There is a balance nature uh, reaches in the long run. And um, this became the backbone of my narrative in my later on work. I always turned back to nature when I was like I starting from 2014, I was making work about healing after cases of trauma, not only personal, but social cases of trauma. And I kept on going back to nature all the time. This is a video I made uh, around the same time. It's called the screen and I can show. Uh, while I talk, actually, it can run in the background because it doesn't have sound. I projected this on top of a medical screen too. These are images I cut out from a Soboto, Soboto Atlas, like every medical student has this atlas. And I cut images of um, human body, mapped images of human body, and I put them in the sea again, like this like vast territory. Um, I'm thinking about the long run, like uh, what do tragedies mean in the long run? Like, is there this peaceful place that we can look for. Um, to be honest, like this inspiration for this video is two things. I want to explain it without sounding um, like I was thinking about a red skull for a while on my own. Like um, it was a metaphor for a feeling of uncomfort, let's say. And I, in my mind, always was working with this image, like how can I transform this image? What can I do with this red skull? And I could find no peace, like I was thinking about burying it, you know, but like things sticking on it, like it never felt good until I found, I thought about like throwing it into the sea, this disturbing imagery I had in my mind, throwing into the sea. I imagined it falling down slowly and like, sitting on the floor of the sea and like it's flesh being eaten by the fish and then like it's sitting there all white and up that gives me a sense of peace like uh, beyond one lifetime maybe like a long run kind of peace and uh, when i made this video where i made this video it was a really tragic time too you know lots of refugees were trying to cross to the greek island across and you don't know, um, in the face of such tragedies, um, you don't know uh, how to make sense of it, to be honest. Like, uh, there we are having a summer, and then there is a parallel universe happening in the same place that in the nighttime people are trying to go across. And uh, the world embodies all these immense suffering. And uh, making this video um, made sense the moment i'm not going to say this is a resolution or anything like that because the pain is too immense but it's um it gave me some kind of uh, peace let's say um later on i made this film in diyarbakir in the kurdish region of turkey there is a village called, like there is a um, town called Kup and there was a village called Ağaçlı where they reintroduced silk farming as a rehabilitation for the region because there were clashes throughout the 19th between uh, the Kurdish rebels and the Turkish military. This is a heavily wounded region and um, I shot this film in the summer of 2013 and you know the post office is burned like People all migrated to the West. There were only 80 houses remaining in the region. And um, there used to be a middle school. Now there is only a primary school with very few kids. Uh, it's a traumatized region, to be honest. And then they used to do the art of silk farming. And uh, it has also been interrupted due to the free market economy and uh, the conflict in the region. Uh, starting from the beginning of 2000, the government, re government reintroduced seed farming in the region as a way to rehabilitate the people remaining in the region. And um, it's an ancient art, actually, that passed on from the Armenians to the Kurds. And it came back again during that time. 
um, the silkworms um, life is a there is a lot of violence actually violence and beauty comes together in this life story of the silkworm just before it will get out of its cocoon they either throw the cocoons in boiling hot water or steam them to kill the silkworms inside the cocoons to get a continuous thread of silk when i first heard it it was a bit shocking for me like something as pretty as silk uh, came from such a violent process you know and therefore i shot this documentary uh, of an old lady raising her silkworms in this region and the film is almost silent the camera follows the household while she's like constantly feeding the silkworms there's a cycle of bringing them food and like feeding them but i also shot a performance with the children of the village and i asked them to reenact the life of the silkworm and uh, they all know it by heart because in their households to farming is done and they just played it like they remember it and uh, we shot them and um, I edited these two footages together sometimes like while the silk forms are being shot all of a sudden you see the performance of the children it goes back and forth you know I wanted like the silk worms come back every uh, every May even though their lives and so abruptly like and uh, I wanted to include this element uh, and reenact it with the children to talk about hope and uh, because they're the future of these children are really affected by this trauma in the region and uh, you know again um, so like uh, getting my inspiration from the regeneration of nature I wanted to talk about this social trauma. I can show the, actually, I have the teaser of this film with me too, a one minute teaser. It must be, oh, it's not here. It's okay. It's online too, but I can also show it towards the end. Let me go on in the morning in, at the moment. This is an exhibition, I, um, it's a group show in 2017 and this installation I created is called In the Uncertain Light of Single Certain Truth. Uh, during this time, Turkish intellectuals were leaving Turkey heavily um, and uh, everybody was talking about leaving and where to go and how to get a visa, a residency permit, you know, this and that. And this is a trend that's still going on but 2017 was when half of my friends left turkey actually there is this political pressure on academicians and uh, creatives and uh, many people left and everybody thought about the potential of leaving behind turkey and establishing a new life somewhere else like at that point, I was uh, accepted to an artist residency in Paris for three months and everybody was coming to me and saying, me, don't come back, find a way to stay there, you know, things like that. And then it's, an, it's such a big pressure, like if you just go to Paris for three months, you know, you can really enjoy Paris. But if you go to Paris and you think about, oh, can I stay there? Can I start a new life here? Can I, should I really think about this? Then it becomes a very, very, very heavy feeling to be there actually. So I, again, I was thinking about this image of a cardboard box because everybody was boxing their belongings as they're leaving. And it was a very heavy burden on my heart. And I asked the question to myself, how can I make this lighter? How can I transform this shape? Just like the skull example. And um, I tried different things. I tried to paint the box to blue. I tried to somehow fill it with water, you know, put a metal very thin layer inside and fill it with water, things like this. In the end, what um, worked for me was this boxes I made, the alternative boxes I made from wire and tool. Um, I call them the ghost boxes. Uh, you know, sometimes in life, the resolution comes gradually, like you work on something and there is improvement gradually. 
But then sometimes there is an epiphany. You're all of a sudden like, huh, so that was not as much as I thought it was. That was not as bad. Oh, so that was this. Like you have this epiphany moments in life. I just like, I guess, wished at that point so much that like you look at the heavy boxes and then you look at the light boxes. And I like that they are transparent and they were very unstable and unable to carry anything really. And I intentionally left the window open during this show with the wind coming in. They were a little bit moving with the wind too. So I really wanted to, there to be a um, feeling of lightness. And the last element that joined this installation was these pink balls that are bursting out of the... Um, I wanted to bring some cheerfulness, some potentiality for the future that is cheerful. Some like, I think of them like eggs or something like that. Um, so my obsession with boxes started like this. Around the same time I made this film called Astronomical Movements. And this film talks about um, dead, actually, the end. And there is a family in this film. The father is the sun, the mom is the um, earth, and the daughter is the moon. And I'll show you an excerpt from this film. I think I have to be quicker. Şimdi öyleyse milyarlarca sene sonra ne olacak? Güneş de soğuyacak. Nitekim kainat da böyle soğumuş, ısı ve ışık saçma özelliğini kaybetmiş pek çok gök cisimleri var. Ölüyor yani. Yani ben şuna benzetirim her zaman. Kainat da canlılar gibi. Gök cisimleri doğuyor, yaşıyor. Tabii milyonlarca, milyarlarca sene yaşıyor. Ve ölüyor. Genelde şöyle bir düzen var kainatta. Bütün gök cisimleri dönüyor. Samanyolu galaksisi de dönüyor. Güneş de sabit değil. Ona bağlı olan gezegenler dönüyor. Hem kendi etrafında dönüyor, hem güneş etrafında dönüyor. Dönmelerinin nedeni birbirleri üzerindeki çekim güçleri. Güneş dünyayı çekiyor. Ayın dünya üzerinde çekim gücü var. Dünyanın ay üzerinde çekim gücü var. Okay. Maybe this much is enough. Um, this was one of my inspirations, actually. David Royal's uh, book, Pants and Cows. It's a mathematics book, but um, this excerpt is from this book. If you study physics, you soon must face the apparent paradox. Your control over a physical object that you can hold in your hand is less than your control over a mathematical object without material existence. Like, um, I think this film was trying to make peace uh, with the lack of control we have on our lives. And then I went to Paris and, um, I had a thyroid condition there. <laughs> I don't know how relevant it is, but since it's a personal presentation, I put it there. This is a drawing I made my thyroid myself. And uh, this is a drawing by a French doctor of my thyroid. 
the, my, uh, I had an autoimmune situation where my body just attacked my thyroid and then my thyroid gland was ineffective from that point onwards. It's not a very serious condition, but it's also intensified my ideas about how, how much we don't have control over our lives because the thyroid gland is like regulating your metabolism. So when the thyroid gland is out of order, everything is out of order. All of a sudden your body crashes. Like it's so easy from one day to another, you can just like become very sick. And then like experiencing, like knowing this, of course, I always know this information, but like experiencing this actually intensified my ideas about like impermanence, death, life, and how uh, we don't have much control over the turbulent character of life, let's say. I made a few works uh, when I come back. This is a... Um, work I did called the eraser. I don't know if this eraser is familiar to you in India, but this is a Pelican eraser that every uh, Turkish student has. It's like the most standard eraser we used to have as children. And I made this work as a portrait of George Perec, one of my favorite writers, and also a portrait of myself. You know, um, I was very inspired by George Perec's life story. He encountered innumerable losses during the Second World War. He lost all his family and uh, he didn't have a place, stable place to stay for a long time. Um, yeah, and he forgot his past. He forgot his traumatic childhood completely. There's a book he wrote called W or The Memory of a Childhood in which he recollects the small details he remembers from his childhood. And then he also talks about the dystopian land he used to fantasize about called W. I think instead of his forgotten childhood, he was remembering this. Like he was making up a new um, story, this new dystopian land story, let's say. So I was thinking about erasing traumatic memories, erasing the past, but then an eraser erases but as it erases, it destroys itself, actually. When we forget what remains of us was one of the questions I was asking. This eraser also has an antenna and it wants to connect uh, to the outside. And then it receives and it sends signals. And um, it's also a metaphor for living in Turkey, I guess. So many traumatic things happen on top of each other. And uh, we want to forget, but then once you don't face a trauma, another one, like it's, history keeps repeating itself. So this um, eraser receiving news from the world and sending out signals to reconnect with the world um, was a work I created after I came back from Paris. George Perec is also very inspiring for me because he held on to the world, like even though he forgot his past, he's always making stuff around him in his books. He's like, he says, describe your street, describe another, compare. So this is his way of holding on to the world. Maybe due to time constraint, I will skip this. Um, this is another work I did about life and death um, after my stay in Paris, actually. This is called The Ivy. Um, I uh, put a personal photograph of mine into three pieces. This photograph brings together my, me, my grandmother, and my mother. And then I realized the ivy in the photograph is the same ivy as I have in my house. So I connected these photographs um, with the living ivy, let's say. But then I didn't connect. I left the distance between the photographs still intact because it's not possible to bring back the lost, uh, but we're still connected, Siani. Even though it's not there and we cannot bring it back, it goes on in, there's continuity in life. And this ivy actually both survives in soil and survives in water. In my installation case, it's, I put them in water. They can survive in water perfectly. And I thought of it as a metaphor for adapting uh, within this continuity. Like there's three generations of women. Maybe my grandma could be thought of as a woman 
as an ivy planted to soil, then I can maybe think of myself as a, an ivy whose roots are in water, but then we're still continuing. You know, there is this continuation of womanhood, knowledge, genes uh, between us. This is another work I will talk about called Furu. Furu Ferusat. Furu is the first name of an Iranian poet that I like. And her name, uh, I put her first name as the name of the installation. The place where I was going to this installation uh, has a place called the Memory Center. Like it housed the Memory Center too, the exhibition space. And the Memory Center take, keeps track of people that are lost by the states in Turkey in the 90s. Let me close my window. There's some sound from the outside. Um, so some people in Turkey were lost by the Turkish state and nobody knows where they are. And uh, they are officially not searched for. And this institution uh, keeps track of these people, like keep reminding their names and uh, the moms and loved ones of these people meet every Saturday uh, still to this day. So as I installed my exhibition in the space, I wanted to say something about loss and um, you know make something site specific a gesture site specific pointing to this institution so i worked with these bird photographs um, i shot them in saint joseph high school a french high school established during the ottoman times in the istanbul and when the first first came to istanbul uh, by the end of the 19th century they killed a pair of each animal. It's, I guess, a colonial motive to document the resources of the country. They killed a pair of each animal and they stuffed them. They taxidermied them. Right now in the school, they went on with this gesture until the 1950s, 60s. And the school, they have a huge collection of taxidermied animals from Anatolia and Istanbul. Some of them are even extinct animals, birds. So I got the permission to go there and I shot portrait photographs of these birds. And with the help of two fans, I made an installation um, that I will show you a documentation of. I'm from a I started. Yes, this meeting is being recorded. And uh, I started working with the real archive, working for the Hrantink memory site. And this started my interests in working with the archive. Um, 
Well, I do some work regarding institutional archives and how, what is their relationship to healing? How do we activate them? What it leaves behind and what it keeps, how it keeps it. How can we narrate it again, like you create narrations again using this archives um, for healing. And I will talk about maybe two more works and finish my presentation today. And um, one of them is Slalom. This is a work in progress that I couldn't realize yet due to the pandemic. But this is a performance piece that I hope to realize. In... Uh, Senna, your screen isn't shared yet. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Let me share my screen, sorry. Share screen. Yes. So back to my presentation. So this is the sketch for Slalom, uh, my work on institutional archives. You know, when I was working at Around Think Archive, I realized two things like, first of all, using an archive, you can create endless narrations. You can make Around Think look more lefty. You can look, make him look more nationalist. You can make him like look more as a family guy. You know, you can make, like you can emphasize his journalist side. And um, this really fascinated me, uh, how much potentiality an archive embodies. But also what really, uh, what really um, stayed with me was how much time and effort uh, there is need, like need, is needed to, uh, to narrate an archive. Like to create a three minute video, we had to watch a week long archive video material. So as there are all these, um, all these talks about the end of the world, like, we all talk about global warming and when this pandemic started and you know like people talk about such short periods like in 30 years this will happen in 20 years this will happen i ask myself the question who has time to activate all the knowledge that humanity has accumulated like how will that time and resource be created and um, i looked at slaloming the skiing alpine alpine skiing discipline as a metaphor and i will perform this piece in an archive space with two other performers and we will mimic the movement of slalom skiers who will know very well how to slow down to take skillful turns while they are going really fast and i'm looking for a way to activate the accumulated knowledge in this fast pace we are going towards the you know, projected and, and stories, end of the worlds. Um, one thing what, that happened to me during this um, time is um, I started to be interested in my own archive as well while I was dealing with Ranting Archive. You know, um, not that I'm that of an important person, but I started asking myself the question, what will happen to my own belongings when I die? I collect so much stuff. I hold on to so many things, so many materials. And you know, there is this Japanese tidying up master called Marie Kondo. And uh, I decided to reorganize my belongings and get rid of the excess stuff that I'm holding on to. And regarding paper stuff, she's very, very strict. She says, throw it all away. And regarding photographs, she says, just keep five photographs from every incident. So that's what I did. I, I destroyed part of my archive, personal archive. And then I uh, made a video, an installation using a video with this archive. Here you see a screen and on the screen, this video plays. Here it is. I'll make it silent so I can talk over it. So I shot this seaweed in the Mediterranean. I like how they're fragmented, yet they sway together collectively. 
And, you know, asking all these questions about what will happen to our fragmented stories, fragmented memories, uh, how will we let go of the past? I um, again turn to nature and looking at the seaweed actually gives me a constellation. And this is the title of the work, A Constellation. Um, how they're one yet uh, they're fragmented could be a metaphor um, for the personal archives, I thought. I don't want to take too much of your time and I want to end my talk today with a recent video of mine. And I'm continuing with my work on the archives and there is currently some in progress work, but um, maybe I'll talk about the box and I'll finish and um, would be happy if you have to answer if you have any questions. I would like to run this video as I speak over it too. It has a nice sound, but I will make it silent. Like it just has the sound of the hand stroking the hair. So, I made this video around the same time I shredded my own archive and I presented it together with the seaweed. I don't see that video as a dark piece. Actually, you know, it's not like, oh, I gave up on my past. I know I want to get rid of it. Actually, it was a getting lighter experiment. And uh, um, I don't uh, feel that it's a dark work. So here in this video, we see a woman lying down and sometimes a man's hand, sometimes a woman's hand strokes, strokes the hair and different things, like they run into things within the hair. You know, this could be metaphors for memories or things that are held on to. Could be a metaphor for a traumatic event. Um, and they find this material and then they take it out. It also looks like an operation, a surgical operation, actually. Once uh, more and more things come out, the hands get a bit aggressive and um, they actively try to find something, but then they don't find something. So it's kind of unpredictable when something will appear and with, when it will disappear. I will skip it a little bit. Different things come out, but what I tried many things, like what looks good, what looks effective on this video to come out. And when I put sand in the um, hair, uh, that was very striking for me because I think you immediately think about death when you see soil inside somebody's hair. Right after the scene though, um, I wanted to again remember and hold on to regeneration. So maybe let's watch the last one and a half minutes.
I think about with this video is actually how much um, compassion and human interaction uh, matters in um, letting go. Um, like this collective, like when we embrace each other, touch each other, how can this be an instrument in letting go? Um, and I think it's something I experience in sisters and spirit meetings too. So I would like to maybe stop here. Um, as I said, these are all like a few other works that relate to this idea of the archive and the healing. Um, but I would be happy if you would like to say something, add something or ask something. Sana, maybe you can stop the screen share. And so I can see everybody. Yes, just a second. Stop share. Yes, and I'll make it so that I see everybody together. Yes. Uh, please, Shevna. I just uh, don't have anything very profound to say except to uh, just... Um, express my deep appreciation for your work and it's so rich and so nuanced and so many very evocative metaphors that stay with you that are going to stay with me uh, like the image of the eraser that as it erases it also uh, uh, diminishes itself erases itself in the act of erasing. And I was immediately remembering uh, Ramana Maharshi's famous uh, image about the self, I think, being like the stick that stokes the fire. Oh, wow. And as you stoke the fire... You're consumed by the fire. You're consumed by, by it. And there is no stick left at the end of it. And uh, I was so moved by the, the, the artwork of the ivy oh. uh, relating three generations and the real and the um, just very, very beautiful. So thank you very much. If there's any question that's arising in me, it's to ask you about your process. I'm curious to know about your creative process, how does it work for you? And what do you think it does for you? Thank you, Shabnam. It's very, uh, I was stressed to talk in front of you today. <laughs> so it's very nice to hear this from you. You're my teacher, you know, and I, we, we I'm so... <laughs> each other all the time. Well, um, thank you for your comments. I'm very happy to hear them. Um, yeah, this process actually question. Thank you for this question. It reminds me something, you know, it's um, I guess uh, it's a nonverbal thinking process, this art creation process. And sometimes one bit arises than the other. It's an intuitive process. So um, I have an idea about the villagers reenacting the life of the silk form. Then I found out, oh, there is a rehabilitation program in Eastern Turkey with silkworms, they come together. Or when I was looking for bird portraits, I became aware that uh, San Joseph High School has this huge colonial connection of Turkish birds that are taxidermied two centuries ago. So like things come in front of me and I usually have ideas. I was like always thinking about what's in the bonds of women in weddings. They put weird stuff sometimes in these bonds to make them look bigger, you know, this hairdos and this, for example, hair video idea came from there. But sometimes, you know, my work can be wiser than I am, you know, I think it's because you are in a, a, a nonverbal thinking process and it's intuitive. Once you start thinking with, you know, your analytical mind and you're being rational, then things lose their um, potential to surprise you, let's say. You know, I think it happens to every artist that 
they learn from their work and they get surprised by their work later on or like they look at their work a few years later and then they see something else and uh, I think it's uh, all got to do with it being a nonverbal intuitive process I would say Sonia G's hand uh, sorry Shabnam please if you no, would no, like I was to... going to say thank you that's all Okay, Sonia Ji, would you like to say or ask yes. something? Yes, uh, one of, first of all, a very, very deep appreciation and love uh, the way you have presented your work so freely. And also you explained it so well. So whatever Shapnam Ji uh, shared, I completely resonate and agree with that. I'm sure everyone would. Um, as I was uh, going through each video that you shared, okay, it became a process of settling in, okay? And I'm also into a space of healing and therapy for trauma in a very small way. The kind of the trauma that you talk about, the country and the migrants are much, much bigger. But what amazed me was that there is this a rooted sense of healing in you, okay? And each video spoke of healing from a different way. So I was like, here is a person who can really heal by just talking about or you know taking through one video. Uh, Thank you. And, and and the title of the talk uh, really stood out for me. This is really art for healing. Well, I have to thank Pedro for the title recommendation, but I really like yes. the title too. Yes, yes. So uh, thank you for healing uh, whatever aspects of universe you are touching and also the people that you are connecting with and leaving such a rich legacy of process of healing as Shabnam ji said those images of the IV and especially the metaphor of uh, seaweeds I found it very very touching Thank and uh, the last video was really really beautiful taking out the memory uh, metaphors sometimes looking for them and sometimes just coming across them and Lastly, I cannot resist but say that what you spoke in the end about this, that when an artist is in the flow, uh, the universe plants that surprise and that greatness. It's not from the cortical brain. It's something else. The abundance has flown through you and you're just letting it uh, uh, come out and showcase in its own beauty. Thank you so very much. I have thoroughly enjoyed the last 19 minutes. Thank Short you. Lesson. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So I think there is something like a chat I will read. In India, we have Eli Silk, which is also called Ahimsa Silk, where the worms are not killed. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, Gita, for this um, information and Sonia for your uh, comments. I think um, we are at the end of, yes, Tejal. <laughs> I, is my, I don't know if my audio breaks, then I'll switch off the video. Is it okay? No, it's, it's probably not so good. Um, but uh, Sena no, it's just good. It's perfect. Really, really wanted to thank you for your uh, presentation. And it was very beautiful because I only was familiar with Sena's work still around 2009. So when we were planning this presentation, um, Sena sent her artist statement. And what she said was she really wanted to chart out that how at first she came to art to heal herself. And then from there it moved to, you know, healing as her subject of research itself. So it was very beautiful to see this movement. 
And um, I feel that your works have a quiet power. They are very quiet, they're very subtle, they're almost very innocent and humorous, but they are very powerful. There's, there's a punch behind which can't be missed. It's almost sometimes even a very violent punch, but it's done in a very quiet, gentle, stroking way. So that's very interesting also to see your personality and then to see the work, you know, it's like, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> and um, what, I, what I found very interesting in the piece um, where the birds come alive from being in a frozen state is that while you speak about that movement, I also found it very interesting that you took water which was alive and you made it dead, you know, by cutting it and having these 2D photographic images. So it was nice to have the movement in both directions. And then of course, you know, the magic realism that you employ in such a very simple, it's, it's innocent and it's simple, but really beautiful. So it was, it was amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for everything. And uh, well, and thank you. For <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, please, if there are any last comments or feedback questions, yes, Maria, please. Um, yes, and I also want to thank you very much. I, I, um, I really like it. Was I don't have a lot of. I'm not feeling like I'm not able to articulate, but I just felt. Uh, just a lot of feelings of tenderness um, while watching, while you shared your work and the whole journey. Um, and as you ask such big and important questions um, about life through that, you know, I, I sort of resonated also different parts of myself from different stages uh, came up. Like when I've had these questions, I also worked in refugee camps for many years. And so just all of these different questions and suffering. And I love how you keep coming back to nature um, when you speak of healing and, and just, it's just, it feels like nature sort of just, just looking to nature answers all of those, um, those bigger questions in, in a way that's hard for us. Yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. And like the way you played with also just weight and lightness um, in, in terms of healing, uh, water, um, birds, um, and so, yeah, so, so, so thank you. Like I, I, I felt a little bit of a healing process within me actually through, through your um, session. And I don't know if there's time for a question, but if I may, or if one question were to come to me, it's, it's, it's also, it's like, where are you at now maybe with some of these questions? Um, is, it, is it different in any way from, from where, you know, from the work you've, you've shown us? Or, yeah, that's, that's all. thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. And where am I at? Uh, at the moment, I'm, uh, um, I'm actually thinking about what can we hold? And what do we let go of? You know, I'm now in the process of making new work, what remains and, uh, you know, I'm uh, actually I collected stories in Basel from immigrants, and uh, they are not in official archives. I'm also interviewed, I interviewed archivists of Basel and their stories are not in the archives and I'm working on a book um, with their stories and my interviews with the archivists, you know, an artist book. It's not like a academic book or anything like this. And, you know, I'm like, I have some ideas, but I'm really um, with this image of swaying together Medov or like uh, this being separate but swaying together image is very strong in me. I think I'll make one more work with this image. Yeah, these are what's going on uh, with me at the moment. And um, uh, you know, I just saw in chat that Sonia said, please share your website. What I can do is actually not everything on my website. Like my website is very easily easy. But what I can do is also this work I shared that is not public, I can send you with the passwords and we can share it in the WhatsApp group. So I will prepare a document, uh, if it's okay, Tejo, with the film uh, passwords and all that. 
but in a few days, because I'm traveling right now, speaking to you from a village in Chanak Kale, and in a few days, I'll get back to you with some links, passwords, etc. Uh, Senna, sorry, I had one last question. Did you ever revisit the screen that you left behind in the forest from your Did dad? You, I took it back, Tabiki. <laughs> you, I, you took I, it back. I, I took it back. It's in my studio. I didn't leave, I, leave it there. But it was a, like a gesture. It was a proposed gesture, like to how to end the film. But I have it in my studio. I love that retro uh, screen um yeah okay thank you <laughs> thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you. Is so any last comments sandra gita nilanjana nivita <laughs> comments questions no okay so thank you yes. so grateful. yes please uh, nilanjana Go ahead. Yeah, hi, Tejal. Uh, Sena, thank you. I I was so overwhelmed, actually. I really don't have words. Those images have really stuck, stuck with me. And um, yours is a very authentic journey, you know, a very deeply felt. You, I mean, all of us are going through really bad times. I know that Turkey has similar... I mean, we are going through similar times in India, you know. So it, mm -hmm. it is, must be a very lonely journey for someone creative, someone who thinks and who wants to stay back in Turkey. And, you know, it must be so lonely. And um, you yet you have found a way to give expression to what you're going through and share the way of seeing. And I really thank you for sharing your way of seeing things, you know. Because for me, like many others have said, it was like, healing. Yes, it's possible to transform your pain through art like this. So thank you so much and um, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Nilanjana. Yeah, so yes, the recording of this session will be shared on our YouTube channel and we'll also send it by email and WhatsApp. So if you're on our database, you will receive yet another email from Sisters in Spirit. And thank you. We're so happy that we could host you, Senna, and uh, for your generous sharing and always to have very nice intimate gathering or sometimes large gatherings. So thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.